day two of HeroQuest fans, and we've got, I'm, I'm really sorry, is it Patrick O'Rourke or Patrick O'Rourke? Patrick O'Rourke. Okay, I was going to call you one or the other, and I was going to get it wrong. <laughs> no worries. Thanks for sitting down for an interview. Uh, thanks for sitting down for an interview, and so I hear that you're a marketing guy. Is that true, or what do you do for Avalon Hill? I mean, I guess. Marketing's a very pretty big vague term, especially in the, the world of board games. Uh, yeah, I I do the, I, would, I guess it's product development and business strategy for Avalon Hill. So uh, generally I'm the business lead. So of everything that we're making or deciding to make next, I'm the one who's representing it within the organization and trying to get the next thing to happen. Okay, are, are you on the Discord watching and reading what people are saying about everything? I am, I am. I mainly lurk. Uh, I'm Intergalactic Patrick on there, so if you see me around, that's what I'm doing. I try not to talk too much because I'm much more interested in what everybody's saying than what I think because I already know <laughs> what I think and I know what the organization that I work for thinks. Um, so it's great to hear what, uh, what actual players are saying, what makes them happy and what we're doing that frustrates them. Yeah, listening is, is very important, so we certainly appreciate that. And you know, uh, one of your colleagues was making a joke earlier about like, oh, who cares? But as you know, um, whenever anything is off one bit as far as HeroQuest goes, I mean, they're like, what is the marketing department doing? You know, what are they thinking? Why are they doing it this way instead of this other way, which would seem so much better? Yeah, yeah, I see that. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I'll say two things. One, we're not perfect. And two, there's a, it's a lot more complicated than it seems when you're part of a, a large organization with conflicting priorities and stuff, you know? Yeah, and, and we figured that. And, and of course, you can understand the position we're in as fans and customers is that um, on the one hand, we're thinking, gee, Hasbro's a big company. They're trying to make money. Why would they make stupid decisions? But then, <laughs> but then we know that companies will do things and it's kind of bewildering and we don't understand why. It's like, why would it be this way instead of some other way? Right. Like, let's start at the beginning. And uh, I appreciate your time, of course. But the beginning of HeroQuest coming back in 2020 as a crowdfunding campaign, I was unfamiliar with all of that world and I'd never pledged anything before. A lot of people, I think, were confused by that or didn't quite understand why it was that way instead of some other way. What can you say about that? Well, I can give you my perspective on it, and the reason we chose crowdfunding is we didn't have any sort of real data, real data that you could talk through to, you know, people who hold the financial, who make financial decisions within the company to justify the size of what HeroQuest is. It had been out of print for so long, we knew there were big fan communities. As, as you know, you've met several of us today, we're all fans of HeroQuest. I had the original sitting on my desk for months trying to get people to play it and checking it out and trying to get it back in the, in the market. But we really had no actual information about how well it would do and what would justify the investment of bringing it back. So what we were able to do is say, well, if the fan community is so big, we'll let them tell us whether they want it or not. That was really what the, the point of view was from, from, the, from the company and how we were able to get the initial investment and how we were able to keep it alive is because the fan community spoke very loudly and you're like, yeah, see, we knew we were right, but we didn't have any proof. And so we needed the crowdfunding campaign to prove it. And it was amazing. I owe my whole career at Avalon Hill, thanks to all those people who jumped on that crowdfunding campaign. Because I honestly knew, I was like, well, I'm a, I'm, I play a lot of games, big fan of games. I don't go to Hasbro Pulse for things. Like I knew it'd be, it'd be an uphill battle and a lot of education there. But people love HeroQuest so much, they were willing to do it, which I'm, I'm extremely thankful for. And the whole reason the line gets to continue, you know. Very good, very nice. Well, and I was thinking in my feeling, and I know that you're the one being interviewed here, but I, I'm sure I'm not alone in this. There's a lot of franchises that have come back, a lot of brands that have been revived out of, you know, a way to cash in on nostalgia. And they kind of have a mixed track record. And so I was really nervous at the start, thinking like, oh man, they're going to take the, another thing that I like and kind of just scatter it and remix it and change it. One thing that I, I, I did look at, and of course it was completely defunct, but this um, what was called Sue Quest. It was called the uh, 25th anniversary Hero Quest right before I think Hasbro reacquired everything that they needed. And 
Can you tell us anything about, was that a big headache for your company or what did, did that cause a more negative reaction or did that maybe get people thinking about HeroQuest and so maybe it indirectly helped out or what could you say about that, if anything? I have to be careful. There's, there's some legal things here that are complicated. It was, it was a barrier for us to get started. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't, it, because of the way HeroQuest has existed outside of any company really managing it, had created a lot of, a lot of hurdles to overcome. So I suppose uh, there's the confusion of it. I mean, it took me a few minutes to figure out, okay, maybe this is not the official one and you know, maybe there's something else I should be looking for. Thankfully, it was far enough along that I was already seeing people that were upset about, oh, I'm not really gonna get this product, it's not really gonna happen. And I think, I know it's a different company and everything, but the producers of that, um, I think it was Game Zone Miniatures, and I know I'm not trying to start any fights here, but um, they were saying, well, you can either buy our game or you can buy Hasbro's game. And I think maybe some people didn't get what they were asking for and there was some court stuff that's happening that, I, that neither of us can talk about. But one thing I noticed looking at that product was it seemed like the box kept getting bigger and they kept adding more things. And there was maybe a core that was the original game, but then they were kind of going off in a new direction. And I would have imagined that Hasbro HeroQuest would have been, okay, we're going to make a modern game that's inspired by HeroQuest, whereas you guys chose to instead pretty much just do a reprint with a facelift and then a couple of little things tweaked here and there. Can you say anything about that whole development of the decision? Yeah, I mean, you're right. We did a lot of playtesting prior to launching anything, of course. And everything from like, let's make a super modern dungeon crawler that has all the tile laying and things you would expect out of a, of a dungeon crawler to well, how do we simplify it and make it even easier to play, right? Like we were just experimenting and testing. And uh, one of our, we have a great design team and one of our designers was like, I don't think with this core box, we should mess with it. It's great, it's a great game. So if we want to introduce new ideas and new game mechanics, let's use expansions to do that. So if anybody who just wants to play the Hero Quest they played back in 1989, they can buy the core box and they can enjoy that. But then we can try to experiment and push things and try to do new things through expansions and then let, let the players decide the type of Hero Quest experience they want. And I think that that insight really led to the methodology that we're following today. Um, you see it with Rise of the Dread Moon. You see it with with even Frozen Horror. We took things that we knew were working and were great about the original run, but we're you know trying new things. We're trying new things with the online quests. A lot of that is to see and learn from what the players are doing, so we can make it better over time. Very nice. And this is, I think, a question that probably gets asked a lot. Maybe you're tired of hearing about this, but. <laughs> The fact that HeroQuest is not just one game, I mean, you've got the North American rule set, the one that I grew up with, um, which I think is more the basis of this game, but you've also got the European version, the Japanese version, and maybe some quirks and some other versions too, like the Brazilian version. So what was the discussion like, if you recall, like selecting a version or maybe re reaching for doing research into other versions? because. I mean, I see you, you have some of the equipment that's from like the European version thrown in there. Uh, a couple tweaks here and there, maybe inspiration with the artwork. So what was that like, kind of researching? Uh, that, that was probably some of the hottest debates we had as a team early, right? Like, what are we, is it, is it more cars, Argon? Is it, like, what are we doing? Grim dead. <laughs> and I think we decided we wanted the best of both. And I think that's kind of how you ended up with what we have. Oh, yeah, we were trying to recreate the original experience for as many players as we could. And then it gets complicated, especially when you get into some of those European countries, which we have a huge fan base in Europe. Um, and you know, we, didn't, we knew the Zargon decision, we wanted a unified name. And we knew that that decision would cause some ripples, but we were like, for us, and especially as we try to build the brand out, Having your like lead villain have two different names is very confusing. He goes by many names. Many. <laughs> I mean, you are right. You're right. But you know what I mean. 
Like, it, we didn't, we wanted to make it easier for people, especially people who've never played before, for us to be able to explain the game and explain things. So, yeah, we made a lot of uh, judgments on, of, of the two systems and of the two ways they were approached, which, which one was more successful in its heyday and which one do we think makes the overall feeling um, feel a bit uh, more pulled together. You know, I, I really wish I could I could snag some uh, European HeroQuest fans and just kind of like interview them. Yeah. There's one guy I know, uh, Hispa Zargon from Spain, and he and I talk a lot. And he's much more about like researching the his the historical like background of all these different versions. And there's a few other people like him. I think there was one guy online, and I I have no idea how representative it is, but he said that he preferred the new game. Um, even though it was not the rule set he grew up with. But his, it was, he had kind of, he was one of those people that like had soured on Games Workshop. And I know from yesterday's interview, we were kind of talking about how maybe Games Workshop doesn't get enough credit as far as this whole thing goes. They're not, they weren't really the bad guys in this. They were working with you guys to come up with, you know, the way forward for the game to come out at all. Because how do you catch lightning in a bottle? How do you get that collaboration with I suppose all the entanglements of who owns what, when and where, and... Games Workshop has been phenomenal to work with. They've been great great partners. Hasbro in general partners with them on, on many things. Um, now they're a British company, is that right? They are, yeah, they are. Um, and so we know, you know, we've got friends who work over there too, just from being in the industry. And I have nothing but positive things to say about Games Workshop and their partnership on HeroQuest. They were super cool about it. Their whole thing was kind of like, hey, we've got all of this stuff that we've been building lore against for years and years. We can't just disrupt that by throwing in throwing it into HeroQuest randomly. And so they're like, what how can we work together to like kind of suss that stuff out? But still we're here, they're HeroQuest fans as well, right? And they know a lot of their big fans are big fans because of HeroQuest. So like, so how do we make sure that this launch works great? But doesn't ruin any of the future plans we have, and that was a that was really what most of the conversations were about. I don't think, and I'm I'm I was like higher one on this, you know. I was the, I I've been on it the whole time, and I don't think there was a moment in which Games Workshop did not. All they wanted to do was try to make it happen. They weren't trying to not make it happen, right? And so I think that's the best you could ask for out of any partner is like, how do we work together to figure out what what's going to work. And I think um, maybe another part to this guy's criticism, and I, I, I always blank on his name, and I feel so bad, <laughs> but I'll have to look him up later. He's, he's on YouTube. But anyway, um, Games Workshop has kind of a reputation for like doing lots of exclusives. And for some people, that is the hobby, like getting into those exclusives. I remember Warhammer Quest. I kept being told, Warhammer Quest is so cool, you gotta check it out if you ever liked Hero Quest, this is like the next level. And I, would, I went to a game shop and they advertised it on the door. They said, you know, ask us about Warhammer Quest and it was sold out already. Like, and they said, yeah, it was here and it was gone. Like one guy bought them all. And I think some of that fear kind of trickled into this Hero Quest is, oh man, I missed out on the HasLab campaign. Oh man, the Guardian Knight comes out and I missed out on that. So I'm sure that was a big headache for you guys, but what was it like getting HeroQuest to retail? How did that happen? Did you have anything to do with that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was ground floor for the whole thing. Um, that's, see, when you ask me like what my role is, that's the, that's the stuff I'm mainly working on. So like from a marketing perspective, a lot of the, like, the comps part isn't, as, it's the biz dev part and trying to get the, get the game out there. Um, that was exciting and we could only do it because of how much support the HasLab, the, the crowdfunding campaign received. Because um, it got really close and, and I don't know if you can tell me or not, so Joe Manganello's last, he, his Crypt of Perpetual Darkness and then the tier right below him yeah. didn't make it. Yeah. Were there other tiers that we just didn't know about or we're just never going to know? Oh, that was the end. Oh, well, that I, was the if end. We broke, if we broke past four, I don't know what, we would have got into a war room and try to figure out what we could do. The bag of holding. If, <laughs> if only, um, I mean, honestly, the goal when we launched it to be able to make it was considerably less than it funded for. Um, those things kept getting added as 
we knew as more people were jumping on, we started getting, catching wind of how high it was going to get. So it exceeded expectations. Dramatically. Nice. Dramatically, yeah. I remember uh, there was a lot of concern about it not making any, like nobody being interested. And not from uh, my team, but from, you know, the organization. Like, because we didn't know. We had no idea. We had no real facts to work from besides a lot of passionate people on the internet talking about it. Which is great, but there's a lot of things that a lot of passionate people talk about and then they don't, you know, it doesn't commercially translate into much. I suppose I don't know anything about marketing, but I'm trying to imagine if it were my task, what would I do? Would I just send people out to internet forums saying, hey, check out this link? You know, like how would I get people involved? Because it's not like the old days where you could put a commercial on during Saturday morning cartoons or put up some billboards or rely on like a magazine. So maybe you've got people that supported other HasLab projects in the past, like the Katana for Return of the Jedi. Um, but so many people just didn't even know about it. I mean, people like me who never support stuff like that. Like you hear Kickstarter, like, ah, I'll just wait till it shows up at Walmart, you know? So was there, what was the strategy for trying to reach people? I mean, what you're, what you're describing, I, I know you look around here and you see a, a team of Avalon Hill folks. At the time of that Hero Quest launch, there were two of us and a part-time person. Like that's it. Wow. So there wasn't a depth of bench or a depth of budget. It was, it was seriously people who wanted to see the game come back and we were trying to figure out how we could do it. And that, that's it. We were jumping on forums. We, we, did, we did a live stream. We got Joe. Joe was a big fan of HeroQuest and thank goodness. He had been doing some work with Dungeons and Dragons. And when he found out we were doing HeroQuest, he jumped on, so he helped us with a lot of the awareness driving early. Um, but yeah. yeah, I remember that, and I was never a D&D player. I think I've maybe played it three times in my life, and it's always been like Star Wars or something else like that. And I think a lot of people were confused by that because they were thinking, well, what's Hasbro thinking? I mean, Dungeons & Dragons is this totally different game. They're going to see HeroQuest and go, this, this is like a training wheels game. Like, it's, why would I play this? And I don't remember, was there, a, was there already a My First Adventure, like Dungeons and Dragons game already? So what were you guys doing or thinking that you needed to do to differentiate HeroQuest to the world to show that it was different than Dungeons and Dragons? And maybe you wouldn't have to be a fan of one to be a fan of the other, or you could enjoy both in different ways. I think, it, I think it's the second... I think they they actually fulfill different play occasions, use cases, and different people. I, I play a ton of Dungeons and Dragons. I'm a huge Dungeons and Dragons fan, huge Hero Quest fan. I don't I don't play a lot of Warhammer. I want to get into it, but then I'm always warned don't because <laughs> it, it's going to be a lot of work. It's a lot of work for a lot of people. That is the the hobby is the yeah. collecting and the painting and all that. But I, I I think they're different, and I think the play is different, and I think the the type of people you can play with are different. Are we, a thing we say to each other all the time about what we're trying to achieve is we want, we want to be able to develop games that have depth, but you're allowed to jump right into and start playing. Uh, a mantra we say to each other is uh, no sprues, no homework, uh, no prep. And you should be able to be able to play. You should be able to pop the box open, look at it, and dive in. And HeroQuest fulfills that, Betrayal fulfills that. And that was, that's what we really love about those games, because I think, look, I, I love your giant Euro game and all those, but it's hard to play those with your friends because you don't have enough time to play them. But you do want a satisfying game experience that doesn't, doesn't take forever. And I don't know. I'm rambling a little bit, but my point is Dungeons & Dragons is an event within itself that is several hours just to get started. Hero Quest isn't that, and that's part of its superpower, I think. Well, I, I noticed that Dungeons & Dragons, or I guess, yeah, Wizards of the Coast now, but TSR before that and all that, they've been trying for decades to do what HeroQuest does, yeah. is get people into the hobby using a simplified or more attractive to the eye type of game with, you know, colorful miniatures. I'm thinking of like Dragon Strike with the VHS tape, yeah. you know, <laughs> trying to get you, get you hyped up. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, still to this day, they're doing it. And Warhammer... Uh, yeah, Games Workshops does the same thing. It's like, okay, you've got your 40K and you've got your Age of Sigmar and your RPG, but then they still do stuff like Kill Team and Fire Team. Yeah. 
I mean, I bought Fire Team. Of course, it was on sale. But I mean, <laughs> I. It, but I was like, oh, okay. They're simplifying the game for someone like me who doesn't want to sit down for four hours learning some system and then have an even harder time getting my friends to play it. I will say it was a challenge to get people I know to try HeroQuest for the first time because they still have that idea that this looks complicated. Yeah. This looks complicated. I mean, I like these little monsters you've got, but this looks complicated. And then I have to show them it, isn't, it, it really isn't that complicated. I mean, people who play like maybe deck building games or something else that just doesn't click the same way. So. I know early on it was, I think I had this perception, and maybe a lot of people did, of D&D is dice and your imagination and paper. And this looks more like a board game with like little toys that you move around, but I don't have to do a lot of prep, like painting them and yeah, messing with sprues and glue and all that sort of thing. Is that still the appeal to HeroQuest, or is it something different now that people are looking for that you're using to market it? Yeah, I, I, I do think it is. I mean, obviously, the painting community is huge. People are painting them, and it, again, go as deep as you want with anything, right? I try to paint. I'm pretty sloppy. But that's, I'm not an art director. <laughs> I've even tried my hand on it, and I am infamous for just doing one color. Yeah, I mean, it's fun to do, and I get it. And some people are really good at it, and they love it. I don't know. It's hard for me in this moment to say the, a singular appeal of Hero Quest. Because I think, again, it's multi-generational. And depending on your age and who you're playing with, I think the appeal kind of changes. I'll use this example. I have a five-year-old little girl. Um, and she's not your regular five-year-old because she lives with me and I game a lot. She knows there's like daddy's stacks of games and her stacks of games. But Hero Quest is one that we will sort of play together. Again, she's five. So the monsters don't really attack too often, but she's got to dodge them and run around them. And she loves the little furniture. She loves the pieces. She loves the quests and the objectives. And we bond over that in a way that I couldn't with any other game, really. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And she'll hopefully, you know, grow up. And as she, hopefully she's still as passionate about it as she gets older. And then our love of that game will change based off of, of, her, of, of where she's at developmentally. But that's a way different than, I'm sure you and a group of friends hanging out on a Saturday to, to play Hero Quest and try some new things or homebrew some new rules or play with the sandbox that it is. But that's that's also one of the great things about it, right? Like, the homebrewing is is fun and I love reading about it on online, like what people are adding and how they're, how they're adding new move mechanics to uh, an abomination or how they're thinking about different things. And that again, you can do that in that game because it's kind of more a contained sandbox like that. And I was thinking at one time that there was maybe even hostility between Dungeons and Dragons players and HeroQuest players. But I think that's maybe a false perception I had because the D&D players that I met were very open to, like, oh, you're playing this game? Well, here, let me help you out. And at first it's like, oh, they're going to help me out and guide me into their game. But actually, some of the homebrew things that I added to my HeroQuest are kind of D&D-esque. And at the same token, I see them doing more improvisational and simplification. Like, they've got their big core rulebook that they've memorized, but they're like, yeah, it's your first game, let's just yeah. simplify. You know what? It, it happened, you know? Let's not worry about that edge case or that scenario right yeah. now. Yeah, for sure. More that casual, welcoming game thing. Because I think there's a stereotype of D&D players as very the rules lawyers, you know, the people who fight about you know, the exact thing, and they have superstitions about dice and, like, all this weird stuff that people just find goofy, you know, and it's just like, I just want to play a game and have some fun. Is that so wrong, you know? But they're not all like that. No, and well, and I would say, as a Dungeons & Dragons player, that community has changed a lot in my lifetime. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of new players and a lot more role play. You see that way, I guess that's probably thanks to Critical Role or something. Um, but yeah, even, even the D&D &D player, I think, has evolved. Yeah. Well, and uh, it was interesting getting the perspective of a friend of mine, because I've introduced HeroQuest to several people who've never played before. Uh, I mean, I, was, I think I told Chris this. Um, when I did the Frozen Horror, I literally started with people who had never played before, because I'm like, listen, I'm going to show you what happens <laughs> when you bring a new person in. Um, and they were saying, wow, this game is like all combat. 
like all the time. All you're doing is rolling for combat. And it's like, well, you're doing more stuff. Because I, I think of Hero Quest as being an exploration game. Because I compare it to something like Space Crusade where you are just fighting and killing and fighting and killing and then you're done. And it's like, wow, what happened? Yeah, right. It goes fast. But Hero Quest is a little more meandering. But then I guess D&D can be the long game even more. It's like the Axis and Allies of role-playing <laughs> games. I, but some people prefer that. I think, is Hero Quest the type of game that you can scale for people who want a quick casual game versus someone who wants a long drawn out experience yeah i think so i think it's how you treat the gameplay session as well um like it's i think it's i don't know this is just my opinion i think it's easier to play a singular dungeons and dragons session for four hours than it is to play hero quest if you want to play hero quest for four hours you're probably playing multiple quests or chaining something together but the board's only so big, you only have so many tiles, it's more limited in that sense than Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, but that's also good, right? Because you can, you can go get lunch, you can play for an hour, get lunch, and play for another hour. So again, it's a different, it's back to what I was saying earlier, it's a play occasion thing too. Hey, I want my friends to come over and, you know, as I mentioned, I have kids, a lot of my friends now have kids. They're going to come over for two hours and then have to go home. You can't really get a satisfying Dungeons & Dragons session in in two hours. You can get a good Hero Quest session in. Yeah. I was about to say it's like the fast food, but then that makes it sound like it's unsatisfying. I, I've tried to use this analogy. Tell me what you think. I don't know if it's perfect, but if, if we're going to compare it to like Blizzard titles, Dungeons & Dragons is World of Warcraft, where Hero Quest is more Diablo, where like Diablo is more focused on a specific part of the adventure. Whereas Dungeons and Dragons isn't really even focused on the dungeon part anymore. It's much more broad. It's not a perfect one-to-one -one by any stretch of the imagination. But I do. But I do feel like it. It kind of paints like it's not as open world. You're not exploring towns as often, like that kind of thing. I don't know. I was almost thinking of like Gauntlet Legends or something. Yeah, yeah, Gauntlet. That's a great game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I love the original Gauntlet, and this is, I guess it's neither here nor there. I think Gauntlet Legends was one of the few times I saw, like, a remake of a classic arcade game where I thought it actually improved. Yeah. <laughs> and I love Gauntlet, and I love Gauntlet 2. Yeah. Nah, I agree. That game I that game sucked a lot of quarters out of me back in the day. Yeah. The, the Red Warrior needed food badly, and it's like, <laughs> what, am, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> yeah, fair. Yeah. Well... Awesome. I suppose I should let you get back. Is there anything else you want to say about maybe the future of HeroQuest or how you see things going from here? I guess I, I, a couple of things. One, I want to thank everybody who supports it. It's pretty phenomenal, and I, I feel, as I mentioned earlier, I feel very fortunate. I, um, I just started at Hasbro when this whole ride started, and it was my first project, and I've gotten to work on it, and now... Uh, we got to go to Gen Con, we got to do all these things, and really that is thanks to the player community, and a lot of that is thanks to the Hero Quest, like a lot is thanks to the Hero Quest player community. And so I'm, I'm very, very appreciative, because you know, it was just a few years ago I was designing my own bad board games and hoping to work in the industry, and now this is, I get to do, now I get to do this every day. It's really surreal, that's got too personal, but I'm from Chicago, and I used to come to Gen Con and just hang out and like look at, like, like dream. And now it's like I'm I'm in it and I'm doing it and part of that is and a big part of that is is, is Hero Quest. So I'm thankful and appreciative. I think on the on the future of it, it's like for every every expansion pack or core game that somebody picks up helps me be able to make the next one. So I'm always watching really the math of it to make sure we can continue investing in it. And so it's like if, if the players are still excited and happy for the next thing to drop, we'll be able to continue to make them. And we have plans for a couple of years. I know there's been some stuff on the internet, um, and you can you kind of start to see parts of that roadmap. And there's a lot, like a lot of the work I'm doing is like, honestly, thinking about 2026, 2027. Like I, that's where my head ends up going most of the time. That's because it takes years for the thing to actually happen. Um, that's the hardest part, I think, because. Yeah, it's not like a video game. Well, I guess video games take a long time to develop too, but that idea that, oh man, you got to like, you can, I'm saying the wrong term, but you send it to the printers and you got to design the molds and there's all this waiting and... 
Yeah, and you gotta you gotta get the investment. You've gotta get the the team. Like you gotta get the people hired to do it, the right people to do it, and all that just takes takes time. You have to if you need an agreement with some partner, some you know all that. It just takes a while, and so you end up planning you know a couple of years into the future. And not that the stuff happening next year, or 2025 isn't couldn't change or us make a new thing or us like react, but it is. It's a development cycle, and every time like I guess my point is is as as we continue to get support today that will actually help us support it longer term as well because the ball starts moving um, I'm really excited for the releases I I'm so happy rise came out uh, rise of the dread moon because that's the first chance we had to create an all original thing hopefully I mean I'm watching reviews very closely and, and watching all the videos that get posted um, hopefully it's liked and we can continue to do more originals um, the re-releases are great as well, but you know, as a team of creative folks, it's fun to make new things. You want to leave your, your your stamp or your mark on it. You just want nobody gets into this business who doesn't love to create. You're here to make. You're here. We're all creators of different kinds. That's what that's what we want to do. Not just a cover band. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I, I I I've what we'll say is like blow the dust off an old box. That's kind of what we did with the core game, right? Which is great and we did some good stuff there but it's fun to create and i think you know i hope we'll see what happens with rise we'll do more if people like it a lot we'll do more reprints if that's what people are interested in as well it's really up to the player community sorry i'm thinking of extra questions uh let me know if you still got time do you have a um whose decision was it to get stephen baker on the project i'll take credit i don't know if it was or not Stephen Baker's an awesome dude, and he doesn't live far from our headquarters. So, and uh, a friend of mine out at the company had his phone number, and so we just called him and asked him, and he said, yeah, cool, let's go. Like, it was really the most, that's why I don't know, it was really the most easy, nonchalant thing was Stephen, to get Stephen Baker to do it. He was not, he was in, we let it, like, he had worked at Hasbro, around Hasbro up until like maybe four years before we brought it back. So a lot of people already knew him. And so it wasn't, yeah. And he's, again, one of the nicest guys I've ever met. <laughs> that was my impression too. I, I just sent him an email one time saying, oh, you know, I really appreciate the work he did. And he was very nice, gracious about it. I think maybe some people have this impression that, you know, I, I guess when you think of like big personalities like George Lucas and Star Wars, like I'm thinking like he's gonna walk in and, and like have his head down because oh, everyone's messing with my thing. But now that I've heard many stories about it is really HeroQuest was a collaboration from the beginning. He had to go back to the drawing board a couple of times before we got the game that we kind of experienced. So I guess he's, he's a seasoned enough guy that he wasn't like intimidated by this. He was. You guys weren't having like big struggle sessions about, you know, who's going to do it. No, the energy was not <laughs> anywhere close to, like, there were no problems. It was everybody trying to make something people would love to play, you know? And yeah, that's what makes guys like Stephen Baker great is that's, you know, that's his motive. What motivates him, it, it wasn't an ego motivated thing. It was really a how do we bring the game back and how do we make it something we'll all love to be a part of. And, and I think when I first heard that he was going to be having his own quest in the uh, uh, HasLab campaign, I thought, oh, it's just like a celebrity endorsement. Like, well, we'll get Joe Maganello, we'll get Stephen Baker. But when I actually read through that quest, and I haven't played it yet, to my shame, other many other people have, but I just, on every page, there's lore, and there's surprises, and there's gimmicks in a good way. And you could just tell that it, he was just like... Like almost, I hate to say like a kid again, but it's like he talks about going back and it's like, you know, so many things have changed in the industry, but he's right back there and he's trying to think back, you know, what was I thinking back then to make these quests? And it really kind of felt like the old magic, so to speak. So that was really encouraging to see. Joe, those quests, those guys made. Like we helped produce, but those they made those, and they a lot of phone calls about their vision and their dream, like what they wanted it to be. But there was no, it wasn't like we made it and they signed uh, some contract where we could use their names. They sat there, they wrote them, they did the work. Yeah, it was kind of like a celebrity writer, but the fact that 
I mean, uh, Stephen Baker still, he's doing the narration for the videos. Uh, wait a minute, that voice sounds familiar. It's like, and you know, Chris comes on to the rant cast of all places, like, really? It's like, that's him. You know, and he's it's like, wow, okay. Well, we have a dev in chat, first of all, and second of all, and we appreciate that communication. Um, so other than, uh, so Stephen Baker does work for you guys sometimes. I guess he's an independent. Yeah, he, he's an uh, independent game designer now. Um, he made a lot of games, because, you know, publishers don't always credit the designer, but he's right, like, right. It's part of, it's just a whole other thing that we probably shouldn't get into here, but he's, he's behind a lot of games that come out and are, are quite popular. He's, he tends to do a little more, recently a little more family-ish games, but um, he's definitely in the industry. He comes over to, to headquarters and will talk to us and we'll see what he's working on. We'll talk EuroQuest. I'd love to meet him someday, but I don't know if that'll ever happen. Yeah, he's, he's a nice man. Jay's a good guy. So are any of the other people um, who did those those guest art and the guest quest, are they still working on anything with the Hero Quest? Or can you say? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. That's probably as much, yeah. They're, we're all, I, I think, and I'm sure you know this. If you find someone you like to work with, you work with them more. Like, I just think that's, there's a lot of people that are hard to work with. <laughs> so when you find someone that... that like, oh, we got the project done, huh, oh, okay. Yeah, exactly, and that's how you vibe with people. If you find somebody who they see, we can share a vision together, we'll keep working with them. Maybe this, this last question is not the most interesting thing in the world, but I feel like it, it gets asked of me a lot, and I feel like I don't explain it very well, but what is the difference between Avalon Hill and Wizards of the Coast in relation to Hasbro, if there is any? Uh, I mean, there is. We're a, we're a specific group with a specific charge, different budget. We, we are, while we all work for Hasbro, and we all kind of have, at a certain level, we all, you know, high up, you all report to the same people who are, who are managing the businesses. Um, we, we, are, we have different goals and different teams and slightly different team structures depending on what we're making, right? Like if you think about Magic, I'll use them as an example. TCGs, to make a TCG is a lot different than making a Monopoly. The skill sets required, the pacing, the phasing of projects, all that's much different. So they're specialized in that and they're really, really great at that. Um, they probably would struggle to make a Monopoly, right? They don't know how to mold zinc. I don't know. I don't. Maybe you do magic. I'm not Magicopoly. <laughs> I'm not trying to dog Monopoly and their zinc molding skills. My point is, it's just a different skill set and different group of designers. Something that we bring to the table too is um, we are getting really great at um, uh, developing our miniatures, our 3D molds, our printing. How we think about making those, we're we're getting much more efficient and better at. We've noticed. Thank you. I spend a lot of work, and we want to be great at it. I think you know. Day one, we want to be great at it. I just, it's a, it takes time to get better and better. And, and again, that's different. That's, that's a different charge, different team, different skills required to do that than you would on a um, twister, right? It's just different. And so, yeah, we're, that's how we're structured. And again, it's all at the service of the player at the end of the day. And you're servicing a very different player for a hero quest than you are, again, using twister as my example, than you are for a twister. And you re it requires different things. And I suppose, Maybe it's a totally different ball game when you have something like HeroScape going to Renegade Studios and uh, them making HeroScape for you guys. But then, what if there's, let's say, okay, I'll use a practical example. What if there's something in Dungeons and Dragons that you really want to put into HeroQuest? Is there a lot of paperwork to get that in, or do you have to talk to somebody, or is it just, oh yeah, we all own the same IP and go for it, oh, or vice versa? I, mean, I wish it was that easy. It's not, I, I wouldn't really say it's paperwork, but there's a lot, the more partners you involve, the more complicated it is. So it just takes more time. And Dungeons and Dragons, if you think about D&D, it's got its whole development track that it's on. We have our development track that we're on. If we want to cross those, we have to find the points in which they can align, which isn't always right when you want, like for our needs, it might be earlier than they're ready or later or whatever. So that's really, because again, everybody I think is trying to do what's best for, for their brands and for their players. And so it's finding those points of alignment that becomes more difficult. 
when it comes to things like Renegade, Renegade's a great partner of ours, similar to Games Workshop, right? And I think a big part, benefit of being in the Hasbro corporate structure is uh, you get to make things with partners that you wouldn't be able to make with Hasbro. Just because of the way tooling works, factories work, print orders work, it's, a, it's actually a very logistical thing. So when something goes over to, to Renegade, it's not that Chris and Craig Van Ness, who's standing right over there, are not involved in it anymore. It's just that we're not manufacturing it anymore. From a development perspective, the work is there. It's just not getting printed in, in one of our shops. Um, and of course, they have a team of developers. I'm not trying to say that they're not doing a ton of work either. I was going to say, how many of those designs are still going to go with the next one? But you don't. I can't, I can't talk about that. But they're working in partnership. And, and it's same, like, you know, Renegade, again, they have a lot of Hasbro um, properties. They also have Access and Allies now, and they have others because they're great partners and they do great work. Great. Well, that helps a lot. And I suppose I should ask Chris about this because with the D&D question, I was thinking, okay, so if you guys are making a cleric, you're going to have to look at the D&D cleric and make sure it's not the same. But then it turns out he's like a Shaolin monk or something different, which I'm just discovering now at the conference. But I guess I can ask him those questions, unless you had something you wanted to say about it. Well, no. I think it's important for us not to step on D&D. We don't want to be D&D, oh, and D&D nice. doesn't want us to be D&D. <laughs> so no, no crossover adventures in the future? I would never say no. I don't know. I mean, who knows? And also, like, I might not be in this chair in a year, and it could all change. Like, like I have no idea. Well, I mean, we the fans can make it happen if we want to, but... That's true. It's, and, and if you ask loud enough, it might officially happen, too, you know? Because, again, that's a big part of it. I don't know. I always get a little, uh, personally, unsure of what to do with a D&D &D character within the Hero Quest world without it breaking the Hero Quest world. Um, I'm not sure if we maybe we'll figure it out someday. I don't know. I just we've we've played around with it conceptually, but they are different universes, and uh, they might both have fantasy involved, but they're different. So, yeah, interdimensional gateways. Yeah, of course, you could do some portal thing. I mean. Yeah, whatever sci-fi trope you want to. Like, there's a lot of things. We could do a multiverse, which I'm so sick of those that I will never... <laughs> I don't want to do that. They are kind of being done to death, but... Oh, too many multiverses, man. Too many. I can't even... And I, like... Anyway, that, I'll get on a different soapbox about that. But even Star... I love Star Trek. And even Star Trek's got multiverse stuff going on. And I'm like, what? Yeah, when are we getting uh, Star Wars versus Star Trek? <laughs> and how bad is that going to be? It would be terrible. And let's see if Disney buys Paramount, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, in the world of board games, it could be glorious if you wanted it to. Yeah, and you're, you know what? As a player, you can do that. You could easily take like Star Trek Adventures and mod some Star Wars characters in there and, and play that fantasy out as much as you want. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I want to see Picard in a Stormtrooper outfit. <laughs> He'd suddenly get much worse with his phaser. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it could be great. All right, well, uh, thank you, Patrick, for yeah, your time. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Great to meet you.